this evening, this evening's lecture is the uh, second annual Craig and Mamie Spangler lecture. Uh, Craig is a graduate of the School of Architecture. Craig and Mimi are both architects, uh, both studied architecture, uh, been engaged in the profession for some time. Mimi is the president of a firm that uh, provides leadership services. If you've taken Architecture 770, the professional practice course, no doubt you've had a lecture, a workshop actually, that Mimi conducts on uh, personal branding which is a very extraordinary thing and a very empowering thing, I think, for the students that have been through it. I had the opportunity last year to sit in on that workshop and really found that uh, it was helpful for me to rethink about, rethink my personal brand, something I probably need to, to spend some time doing over and over for the remainder of my career. Um, and Craig uh, was a graduate of the program. Uh, as I said before, he was, um, uh, he did his, uh, his master's degree at Princeton uh, and has had a number of great positions which now has culminated in leadership uh, in the firm Ballinger uh, in Philadelphia, a firm that employs many of our graduates, uh, takes on many interns over the summer. And Craig and Mimi were thinking, what could we do to help the University of Maryland? And what they decided to do was to endow a lecture series. When you endow a lecture series, it means if you give funding for a lecture series, it will lead fund that will that will lead into the future and have funding in perpetuity for a particular activity. And the activity they decided upon was an activity that would focus upon emerging architects, architects who are coming into their own, the people that we'll be reading about in the future, the people that we will be uh, looking at magazines and looking online and seeing their work vividly in the future. And this is a kind of interesting challenge. When, when I first started reading the MOU that describes this lecture series, I kept thinking, well, how do you decide on who the folks are going to be in the future that will uh, be the leaders in the future? And who better to make that decision than the students? So we asked the students to develop a list of uh, individuals who will be the next generation of leaders in the future in the profession of architecture. And the students uh, submit annually a list to the director, and then the director works with that list. It's, a, it's not a ranked list. I've learned this lesson from uh, my colleague, uh, 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 Dean Cronrath, who has uh, often said it's best to have a list that you can work with. Uh, and this, so this is not a ranked list at the end of the day. We work with the list, and we find individuals that we uh, believe fit the bill uh, that match what the MOU's intention was. And in a moment, you'll find this year's uh, lecture, I think, will we'll do just that. So Craig and Mimi and their son Andrew have uh, driven down. Andrew's been in the back seat of the car doing his homework all the way down from Philly this evening. Um, and we understand we're going to review it at dinner tonight to make sure he's gotten all the right answers. Uh, but we want to thank them for coming down this evening, for giving this wonderful gift to, their, to the school, and for really being part of our family. So we really want to thank you. And so the hard part of my job is over, other than to just remind you again, we'll see you all in here on Friday evening and again on Saturday morning. And I want to introduce Renata Sauber, who I think most of you know. Uh, and Renata is a graduate student. And she is going to tell us about this evening's lecture. Renata, I will choose the slides. How's everybody doing? Great. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from Catherine Darnstead of Layton Design. Layton Design is a progressive Chicago-based architecture firm working at the intersection of design and community development um, to create social, economic, and environmental impacts. At Layton, the context surrounding a project is very important. Before the design of the content of architecture, they define the context. They offer thoughtful design <coughs> solutions through an approach that leverages local assets to directly generate project opportunities for all involved. Their projects include small-scale tactical interventions, new construction, community building, adaptive reuse, neighborhood master plans, and design speculation. 
I explained to Ms. Dunstan that the students of UMD have selected her for the Spangler Lecture Series because we are interested in Layton Design's ethical approach to architecture. As students, we are always striving to consider the social, environmental, political, and cultural impacts of our designs. And Layton is, is putting those concepts into practice. Another lesson comes from the wide variety of projects in Layton's portfolio. Architecture is not simply the building, but a thoughtful approach to design with a flexible scale, and we are excited to hear about some of those projects tonight. Architect and educator Catherine Garstad is the founder and principal of Layton Design, a collaborative of individuals <coughs> whose projects focus on social, economic, and environmental impacts beyond the building. Catherine brings innovative <coughs> design to those in resource and budget limited environments through holistic, creative approach to design driven by community needs <coughs> to leverage um, other partners and assets to address project challenges. Her passion for public interest design through participatory strategies and diverse background have allowed her to collaborate with change agents in design, science, art, <coughs> and philosophy. Since founding her practice in 2010, Catherine and her firm have been recognized as an emerging leader in the architecture profession and have been published, exhibited, and featured widely. Most notably at the International Venice Biennale, Core 77 Design Awards, Architizer 8 Plus Awards, Chicago <coughs> Ideas Week, NPR, and as the 2013 American Institute of Architects Young Architects Honor Award winner. Please help me in welcoming Catherine Arkansas. Alright, so hold on, let me turn this on. I'm sure I don't need it, but I'll turn it on anyway in case I get a little quiet, uh, which is almost never known to happen. <coughs> So thank you so much for this honor. Um, I really appreciate it. I think this is a, a really ingenious lecture series to have. Um, it be student-led and focus on what issues you're facing, what issues you're looking uh, <coughs> towards, and how you can start to craft your academic career to match the profession that you want to be in. And you know, I teach at Northwestern University. It doesn't have an architecture school, but I teach in their innovation department. So I think about that, where a school like Northwestern is seeing innovation in the built environment, and they're training. We're training individuals in parallel fields, not architects. And so that's kind of the wild, collaborative, overlapping world that we're walking into as, as an architectural profession, where continually more decisions on the built environment aren't being made by us. And so part of what I'll show in this presentation is a rabbit hole of trying to understand the built environment through a couple projects, um, ho told hopefully in a very honest um, and somewhat humorous format that won't undermine the serious consideration that I give to this profession on a, on a daily basis. So firms are called practices. And the word practice, it means something that you do to get good. It's not something that you do because you are good. Our industry is kind of set up in a way where you don't learn how to run your own firm until you're a principal of somebody else's firm. Hence why we have this average age within the industry that maybe looks a little bit more like Craig than it does like me. And that's just the truth. That's the, the demographic that they're in. No, you know, no disrespect to anyone, but if it's a 52-year-old white male, what does that do to when the majority of the profession designs for a minority of the world and a minority both in sense of persons of color and then persons of income and so on. So that's you know some of these dichotomies that we work with it. And so latent design is a prototype. The same way you have a 3D printer, the same way you have an X card and you have a ventricles here, you're making prototypes and this is a prototypical firm that is constantly in flux every day and you know part of this honesty and transparency is so that you do it better than what I'm doing now. Because that's the goal. That's how we shift it. That's how we shift this industry. So we don't make buildings, we make sit systems. And one thing I think of very, very deeply within the firm is I'm not only making architects, I'm making future founders. So everyone's walking out of that firm knowing how to run a firm, maybe know how to do, do what's right, what's wrong, but then also are getting put into the right place and the right individuals if they want to go somewhere else. 
Some of our um, employees have gone on to urban design, anthropology, setting up um, social networks, and graphic design has gone into completely into the tech field. Others have gone on to firms that actually give them benefits, which I don't, which I totally understand. Health insurance is a big deal. But you know, it's, it's part of that ecosystem of what we're doing. And our work explores the influence of architecture as small or as large as the context allows. And we kind of work in this way where, where, as Renata said, is you know we work at this intersection of design and community development um, to harness these invisible forces within a project. So that's the latency. That's why we're, the firm's named that. It's make the invisible visible through design. It's straightforward. It's not named after a grandfather or grandmother. It's like not named after myself. It is the firm design is the process. So we're trying to put that all together in one name. And you know, this is most often how our work is described at this intersection, but what I really think of it, and this is part of that lecture, is it's really tough shit. What we're doing is not easy. Architecture isn't easy. The work that we're doing at this intersection of social and spatial is very difficult. And this is also the double entendre that we get for many of the responses back to us. It's like, oh, you want to do that? Tough shit. <laughs> you know? And so I'll kind of talk about learning those anecdotal lessons that we've, we've kind of worked in, because now I'm, I'm very adept at this double speak, at this double entendre, and working these informal and formal systems to an advantage. And that all gets into the conversation of what power structures are and how they exist, how design does and does not influence them. And it all started by being very hungry in a literal, a literal and a figurative sense. Uh, this is the very first project that I worked on coming uh, as latent design. When late, I started latent design during the, the 20, not, 2010 recession. So I fell into this interesting purgatory that actually many of you stu students might fall into, especially as schools and at, schools start to shift to this licensure upon graduation. I was an architect with three years of experience, but I was licensed. So once I got laid off from my job, um, I, the three to five year uh, opportunities, job opportunities, didn't want to pay a premium for a licensed architect. Why would you? You know, the architects aren't licensed that early. And then the jobs that required a licensed architect, I didn't have enough experience for, so I didn't need like the bare minimum of eight to ten years. So I was in a complete purgatory, at, but celebrated at the same time of being, you know, hey, you're a 27 year old licensed architect, woman of color, great, awesome, we want more like you, but you have no job, good luck. And so, <laughs> So my firm in Leighton is very much a firm out of necessity rather than planning, and there are so many inherent problems with starting something out of necessity where your plan B becomes your plan A that, you know, I've been solving those over the year, over the years of how the, the actual firm structure has changed, but our point of view still is let's do the work out of necessity. And that, I think that started to become a very strong point of view that we had. So another example of a dichotomy is we have people waiting in line for cupcakes in the middle of winter in Chicago because if you can't get your cupcake fixed when it's below zero, I don't know, you're not living. Um, and then there's the other version of that. So we have people waiting in line, sub-zero, just for food. And this is a, a mobile food pantry kind of compared to the, the, the food truck. So these are both very highly contentious vehicles and policy pieces in the city of Chicago because we actually have one of the worst food truck culture because of the policy um, that has been placed on it in the city, even though we have a vibrant food culture. So it was within these, um, this uh, dichotomy of food that was my first project. And as noted, um, these are also showing power structures through the charity system, which started to unfold in this project, where we, this is Fresh Moves Mobile Market, where in collaboration with Architecture for Humanity before that kind of imploded over the past two years. Um, we were approached by a client who was working within the food systems and within food deserts. And they came to us day one, where they had this wonderful idea, this amazing white paper of like, let's have, this is our solution to tackle um, and increase food access to food deserts in Chicago, which about over half a million people were living in within at that time in 2010. But they didn't have anything else. They had the white paper, they had the idea, they had a little bit of funding, but they didn't have a, they didn't have a business card, they didn't have a website, they didn't have a vehicle, they didn't have a bus, for sure. And so this is the first time for us as a design team, both Layton and the team that I led out of AFH, 
um, that we designed everything but the food. It's the first time that we developed a system and got to work in that realm of, well, if it's not a building, then we don't really need to be architects. It's still space still a system, what if we made the whole entire thing? What does it look like to merge brand and mission and space all together? And what if we could work with people who really inspire us as well? And so we were trying this idea of prototyping in real life and bringing something, merging this idea of civic infrastructure uh, and, and <coughs> material reuse with how we design the bus for the client itself. Because during this time in the research, there was an amazing opportunity where buses Buses retire just like everyone else. So they have a certain year and a amount of miles before they retire. But they don't go to a boneyard, you know, so they mostly, they go to the jail system, they go south, you know, that's why the further south and go through Central and South America, you're going to see like old buses, things like that, because they just get out of the U.S. system, but they are still usable. And so the city of Chicago was de decommissioned buses every single year, and so the clients saw like, hey, well, we need to make a, an actual viable case, because we want to be a temporary solution, in a way, and that's kind of wild for a, a client to come and say, we only want, we want to solve a problem by being temporary, which is, you know, kind of incongruous when you first think of it. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to show demand, so that bricks and mortar retailers would actually open up in the spaces, in the, the areas that were classified as food deserts. So that's where the vehicle came in, because they needed a vehicle of a size that held enough produce that could make enough volume that actually starts to make a financial case. The back of a pickup truck and like a couple plants doesn't do it. You know, being able to move certain tons of food per week shows like, hey, there's actually a demand here, and that fits with and fit with the trend of retailers that were looking for smaller building sizes because they did want to go into urban markets itself. Uh, for us, what was interesting about it is um, working on a bus uh, <laughs> was really quite fun. It was very, it was liberating uh, for us to do that where we had, we didn't have engineering and design challenges. So a superstructure of a bus is roughly every 60 inches. And so that's the only structural points of, of connection that you could have. So we have to find ways that make these, you know, these uh, display trays act in a way that looks like a grocery store. Because if you don't have grocery stores and you don't have produce displays, do you actually know how to interact and use all of the pieces and have the conversation around produce? Because when it's a desert, it's not only from the product and the produce standpoint, it's from the experience standpoint as well. We had to look at that we looked at that so deeply, you know, versus like, do you get on the bus still from the front or the back, or how, where does checkout, what does service look like, how do you do this? Um, and the displays were all custom manufactured, even though you could have done them a variety of ways, but we were looking at how could you actually support 200 pounds of produce? What does that look like? What is that, what does that, from a design aspect, how does this make this space unique? How do you have enough for storage so you don't have to go back to a main hub throughout the day so you can constantly replenish it? And most interesting, in the original design, we actually took the shelving and went all the way to the back. And the staff, who you could see, the staff you could see in the back, in the red, um, in the red apron, they were just going to check out people with iPads and cash and just do that. And they were all like trained in Krav Maga and like everything about like seriously, they were ex-veterans, so they knew how to take someone down if they were trying to like, steal 10 bucks from them. This was all part of their business plan. It was always the old folks, but it was, you know, it was the elderly because they stopped at schools, at nursing homes, public parks, places where there was already an audience and people were already congregated there. Um, it was actually the elderly who had a huge distrust of, you know, like the iPad technology. They were like, we're not, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to buy that. Not at all. So it was like that when it's like, okay, we have to have this counter. We had to have this moment of informal interaction. We had to have that back. Even though the technology and like the systems of, for us as millennials designing it, as for like the team of people who were staffing it that were even younger than us. Like everyone was comfortable with that level of monetary transactions happening through a digital interface, but no, not 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 our aunties and, and everyone else. And you know, it really became interesting because this it, this was something that we didn't know. Because we made it was the first time that we saw our assumptions were so wrong. It wasn't until we actually got that prototype in real life 
in the field, started working in it, and people were giving that real-time feedback that we were able to say, okay, well, luckily we designed it in a way that can be disassembled, so now we can retrofit it and try a different way. So there's a little bit of incongruous design between the shell, the, the finesse of the shelving and you know the final um, checkout desk, because it's like, how much money do you have left over? We spent it all on shelving. <laughs> so, but what we, we saw after that um, was how that resonated. The story about this is, you know, this fell and a project fell at a time where we do have the rise of the amateur as expert and the expert as elitist, and we're still kind of having that tension within the architecture industry itself. I mean, the AIA, from their standpoint, they have their new marketing strategy of IM AIA to talk about, well, you know, architects are everyone, architects can do everything, so we have to get away from the idea that architects are used for this very unique and one-off purchase of a building even though we're surrounded by a building. So it's helping, you know, we have to start to flip that idea on its head. And this, this project came in a sense at the time when these conversations were just starting to happen. And we, we were fortunate enough to be part of the Spontaneous Interventions exhibit in, uh, at the Venice Biennale. We ultimately were, the, the Fresh Moves bus was the prototype for the USDA that gave them a grant to study mobile markets in urban and rural environments. The urban environment and the urban prototype was Fresh Moves in the end. We um, were in Michelle Obama's book, and Homegrown, and we will be in the Smithsonian in the next year. Um, so this idea, and what was funny is I applied for this project for an AIA award, and we for a, they, there's a small project award, so it's like certain size, certain budget. I was like, we got this beat. No one's doing like fifty thousand dollar under bus. Like we're totally going to win. And we lost that to like a chandelier. Um, <laughs> so I, well, I was wrong, but and, and I was I was I was so depressed. Our whole entire team was depressed. I'm like, oh my gosh, our institution does not get the work that we're doing, maybe we just wasted a whole bunch of time. But, you know, the following month was when we found out we got into spontaneous intervention. We won the first Archetizer A-plus award, and it's a, it's a project that now continues to resonate. Uh, we were on the right path, we were looking at the right way, we could have, we were, we were, we were testing that design process, and it, 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 it's one of those things that we need to keep pushing. But of course, what came from that is my most favorite quote. This is from the Core 77 uh, jury, which we were runner-up for. And uh, Mr. Gauthier said, it's a beautiful project, but it might be too socio-political. And that's one of those moments when I read that, I was like, well, it's not tough shit. That's no shit. Every building is socio-political. I mean, you deal with people, you deal with politics, you deal with zoning. And to say that we were somehow taking a stance that was somehow offensive to a French designer, like a French existentialist designer, was kind of funny because if you look him up, he is. He's a he's a French product designer. I was like, if there's anyone who's probably more political, socio-political in design, it's the French. Um, <laughs> What, what, what resounded and resonated with me is that there was this preference for disruption on paper, but not in reality. And so that was very clear that was coming out of some of those jury comments as it went through. And we realized that the majority of our firm's client base has this reality that is in this state of, dis of socio-political disruption. And it's a very risky endeavor where fear and failure are not an option, they're part of the process. And I think what's um, interesting for us and how that resonates with us as architects is we fail on paper a lot before we get to the building and when the building fails it's very notable. But then conversely, um, where I teach in, at, at the innovation school, you know, they're failing all the time and they're failing with their products all the time and like everyone could just let that roll off in a very different scale and ability that you know, maybe it's a, it's something we, we ingrain within academia or within the profession, but there's it's a uniqueness. Uh, we're both having the same human-centered design process, right? Whether you brand it that or not, um, but how we react to it and how we let our how we shape our industry based on fear and failure is very different. And so this is the diagram of what I think are the relationship between design and economy. I first saw that back in 2010, and it's kind of been seared on my retinas since then, and so I always share it 
in my presentation. So this is what we're walking into, right? We have an inverse relationship with design and economy. The most amount of design goes to the least amount of people. The worst design goes to the most. You can apply that to affordable housing, to the product, so you, the biggest example projects. You can apply that to public space and parkland. You can apply it to almost anything, not only within uh, the US environment, but then across the world. We wouldn't have these dramatic building failures if somebody didn't think people were expendable, because there's a mentality that goes with that. But conversely, we have to look at, you know, how do we, we you know, have access is inverted here, but then we have to look within our industry itself. And so we're all architects, we're designers, we're very enlightened individuals, right? Have you, you know, that's what I mean, I could probably be blinded by the enlightenment in this room. But the diagram on the left, are you familiar with it? Have your professors told you this a million times? Maslow's hierarchy of needs? If you don't, if you haven't seen it, you're lucky. Um, but I don't know how I made it through architecture school without it. Because we talk about ourselves that we give, we as architects give the basic physiological base to humanity. We give shelter, we give space. That's the context that that base brings you up each successive level to enlightenment. So if you have a, you have a good home, you're in a safe space, you have a social network because of the spaces that are around it, you build self-esteem, you grow in those relationships, and then ultimately, ah, you're totally zen. But our inverse relationship that we have with ourselves is completely inverted. So while we have a ton of zenful designers, none of us are taking care of ourselves and our core physiological needs. You're, don't sleep. You're going to be broke for probably a solid decade after you graduate. And, you know, and you're going to kind of go into that continual cycle. So how do we actually take care of ourselves and our profession, both at the individual level, the academic level, and then at the, the broader discipline level and kind of get at that core physiological need um, and in that access to access to Zen within our own industry. So this is probably about the time I should say something really nice. Um, so <laughs> the platitude that I could say, and there's many that I've heard, and I try not to, but I could say, you know, do what you love and you never work a day in your life, and that's crap. You know, it's good, it's 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 motivating, you know, but it's also work is work. We live in a design industry where design is life. You do you get this work-life balance, but you go into a meeting, you look at every space, you can't turn it off. And you turn it off, then you don't feel like you're an architect. You're solving then possibly a you know administrative issue of design of doing CAD drawings, or are you decide or are you creating the design issue of space, place, and time and timelessness. And so what I started to think about a lot of this is in going from teaching in an, academic, in an architecture studio to now an innovation studio, which besides the fact that there's such a thing as an innovation studio and a school that has an innovation school is mildly amusing to me just in general. Um, but when I made that transition, I started to look at what we teach and how we teach, and it was very different. So we're teaching two parallel design industries and we're teaching very differently where one is you, you have this kind of lone genius where you're taught, to, taught leadership skills. In design and architects as individuals, we are leaders. We can be leaders in so many different ways. Whereas on the design school side, we're taught to be followers, like observers, and looking at that idea of being amused versus being the leader. And it's kind of this idea that there's this fine line between king and crazy. Let me, let me unpack that for a little bit. So, if you're king, you have followers. If you're crazy, you have none of that. You know, so you can see someone, um, you can see someone who, you see that in our social networks all the time, the lone individual versus someone who has followers, and like how that status moves someone else. You could probably see that with like totally with Trump, you could see it with Kanye West, like what we can see it on our Facebook feed, like what do followers, and on Twitter feeds, what do followers do for our power structure. So we kind of live in that environment already. So this, there's this idea that we need to look at ourselves and kind of think about the, that it might be better to recognize a good idea versus to author it. And that fits into that narrative of the, um, of the rise of the informal expert, 
and what that challenge is and how we observe the good ideas and then how we use that to inform our designs, our industry itself. So that first project, let me take a sip. <coughs> Those first projects were about the first three years of latent design from a um, organizational side. That's when I started latent design. Like I said, after the recession, it was an LLC for people who like want to know these quick details. I started it with ten thousand dollars in a laptop, and this is a sequence of how that all happened. Six months, I had major. Every month was something amusing that happened. So I got I got licensed. Um, I got promoted. I got married. So every month three, I got laid off on my month four. I got pregnant on my month five, and month six I started late in design. That seriously, that's how it all happened. So that's when I talk about the necessity of starting a firm. You know, that's why I have the worst business plan possible to not replicate it. And so we started from that ten thousand dollars at a laptop. Those first three years of projects really framed the mission of what Renata introduced latent design as and what we're pushing the firm at now. And so in 2013, I actually switched the incorporation structure of the firm, where a benefit corporation, I don't know if you're familiar with that incorporation structure, but a benefit corporation um, is state by state. And it, it means you have a dual definition of equity. I look at not only financial equity, but social equity in every single project. It's part of our bottom line. It's part of our mission of the firm. So how that works in reality, I'm like a firm of three people. So like I'm never going to have a corporate takeover. But say I did. Kickstarter is a benefit corporation. They became a benefit corporation this year. Patagonia, a variety of other large institutions and organizations are moving in that direction. But say I had a corporate takeover. So in a traditional capitalist model, you're driving profit, right? So you're going after profit and you know, sometimes you aid for people, that's why you have your corporate social responsibility officer. Sometimes you don't and that's why you have like Flint. Um, and you know, with, with that benefit corporation model, it's showing on your articles of incorporation that you do believe that dual model of equity, financial and social, they have to inform one another and they both have to be done to essentially the same level. So you can't be making a financial benefit without showing a social benefit, vice versa. So then your board, you know, when you make that change, your board can say, hey, I'm out of it, I'm only for maximum profits, but then it makes it harder for them to take, have a corporate takeover, say if Patagonia decides, you know, we're going to invest more in actual Patagonia. Um, or if Kickstarter says we're going to actually start to fund social projects that their board won't come after them. So I made that change. I'm the only architect in <laughs> Illinois that has a benefit corporation, I think, still to this day. Maybe it was a bad idea. I don't know um, because of that. But I think there is something there that it started to align to our mission. I found, like, oh, here's a business model that I can start to grow and develop that aligns with the social mission that I had already within the design firm. And over the years, firms that have that have come to, it's, it's made its own network. So we have um, been shortlisted for projects and have had clients who are like, we want to work with someone who absolutely aligns with our social mission. You obviously meet that, and that's how they come to the firm, which is wild to think of a business development strategy of trying to be equitable. <laughs> you know, what if you want it should just be obvious. And one of the projects how we, we look at this is obviously quality of life relates to quality of space. And in Chicago, our city is rooted in its neighborhoods. We have um, 50 different wards, 77 different community areas, at least 150 opinions about that on any given day. And they kind of, since we have this huge geographical spread to the city itself, we end up with very, it's called fiefdom. So like, the, it, you could say that Chicago, every neighborhood is probably fighting with each other, it's bordering neighborhood or the ward, and it's completely true. Because it's that, how our ward-based and community-based system is based on overlapping policy issues that we will get into eventually. And so when these public spaces and these neighborhoods are built on public spaces and infrastructure, and when they are neglected or inaccessible, they become detriment to neighborhood health and vitality. This is not new news at all. 
And we looked at transforming these interstitial open spaces to be a catalyst for community connectivity and for socialization, and looking at ways that we could bring real access versus perceived access to vacant land. And we'll get into that a little bit more, because you see vacancy is opportunity, but what does access to that mean um, in a formal and an informal sense? And we started in, in the informal sense and went into formal. So Activate, uh, Activate Chicago is our new, our newest project. It's one of many, but it's our newest project. We're in a public-private relationship with the city of Chicago itself. And we are developing and leading the entire creative placemaking initiative for the city of Chicago on a variety of public spaces. So creative placemaking in the informal sense, you have your paint, your things, and I'll show examples of that. Um, the formal sense is it's a multifaceted approach to the planning, design, and management of public spaces. That's what the RFP says. So that's creative placemaking in you know, municipal speak. <laughs> And so what we looked at is what can we do with place? How do you make place and how do you make place and quantify it versus qualify it? And how do you actually make a new urban design system for the city and why does a city at the scale of Chicago actually not have a public space, a proper public space infrastructure, which was part of why uh, Leighton and our partners decided to even pursue the RFP in the beginning when it was released uh, because we saw, we were, we were shocked in a sense. And so one of the things that we're looking at is how do you capitalize on local community assets? How do you look at inspiration and potential? And how do you promote people's health, happiness, and economic well-being? That's a qualitative part of it itself. And so we, we're coming out of a time where many of our projects also up to that point have been emphasizing objects over objectives. We have been, we were creating giant neon blow up things. We have an affinity for neon. We were creating parklets and developing that for the city. We were doing a lot of exhibit design. And we were also talking nationally about creative place making, both at the NEA and then elsewhere throughout the country. And I was like, we're just showing really sexy objects. Like, how does this get into something else? Where is that, that barrier? And how do we, we should, yes, of course, celebrate these beautiful moments of art, tech, and design, but also realize they're not authentic and they're not sustainable. So how do we make plays sustainable and systemically? We started with a couple, couple barriers. When the city came out with this RFP, it was like, here's our, our version of a creative place making RFP for the city of Chicago. You could do X, Y, and Z, send your proposals in. And our team, we put together a 170-page proposal, sent it in, didn't hear from them for a, a, you know, a, a good solid eight months till later when they asked for an interview, and then we didn't hear from them for another four months until they called and said we won it. And we're like, what did we win? I forgot. Well, it's a year later. You totally forgot about it. We thought somebody else had won, and they were in contract negotiations, but apparently it was us. And so we started with looking at the very simple things. And part of our proposal was what's unnecessarily difficult to do in the city that falls under creative place making. And one of that is just doing perform having a performance in a public space is a ridiculously onerous process. So if you do this in the formal, so you have two ways. Informally, you go, you show up, you dance, you play guitar, you busk. It's called busking and you get some, you know, maybe get some donations, maybe not, and then you leave. So that's the ask for forgiveness model. The ask for permission model is you go, you go to the Department of Special Events and cult Cultural Affairs and Special Events, you ask to fill out a special event permit, it's a 40-page permit, you need to submit that 45 to 60 days before your event. Your event, if it's probably an hour or two hours, like most of them, they're not big festivals, it's not Lollapalooza, but Lollapalooza and a bunch of buskers go through the same process. So you're going to spend roughly about maybe four to five hours for a one-hour performance. That's the first barrier right there that just stops all creativity. And then, it, then because the public space is, public space was governed by the Department of Transportation, but cultural affairs and anything culture is governed by the cultural affairs department, that's left hand, right hand, have no idea what each other is doing. So there's another barrier, and that's um, an internal departmental barrier and a conversation and communication barrier on top of a logistical paperwork barrier, an administrative barrier. So one of the first things we do is like, all right, well, how do we actually make, make this happen? So one of the first things we did was streamline the whole entire <coughs> cultural um, permitting process. So now that we take 
we were able to streamline that for us as the public-private partner, and then a group can just come and contract us directly with us without a permit, without anything like that, because we made the case like, hey, 20 dancers on a plaza for an hour is really not going to cause a terrorist attack. So can we just lower that bar a little bit down? And then when we had that opportunity, then we were able to say, hey, we have this accessible opportunity deeper within the neighborhood. So Joffrey Ballet, high culture institutions that are based in the loop in the downtown area, let's get you to decentralize and bring your amazing work to new audiences. And so that was the first, first thing that we did was start to pick that low hanging fruit, make it easier for cultural performances to happen, and then cold call every institution from the Joffrey to the Chicago Symphony to you know the um, you know to you know folks at Lollapalooza say what does it look like when you actually go from the bigger to the smaller, make smaller, more unique and intimate experiences that are ephemeral, and then also use that to, to catapult the local artisans in the neighborhoods um, who may be have wonderful art or wonderful bands, but aren't considered artists in the formal sense. Cities curate art. They curate professional artists. They don't curate your Friday afternoon band. You're not going to get an art grant. You're not going to get a public art commission that way. It's very difficult to be a professional artist, but you can still be very good. So how do we make that platform available for both high and low to come and intersect that? It always that intersection of informal and formal. The next thing that we looked at, so that's one problem, the cultural problem. The next thing we looked at was, was let's get back to objects. You know, let's get back to basic. Let's look at a site. What does it need? You know, trees. You have the beautification side, so it needs trees. It might be needs some planting, fine, we can deal with that. But then it needs somewhere to sit. You're not going to linger if you can't sit. So we looked at the process of actually getting a bench within the city, and that was its own thing. And so we, we circumvented that and said, well, what if we could actually make a kit of parts of rapidly deployable street furniture that communities could pick from and could go onto our plaza sites itself? City said, fine, we'll look at that kit, great. And then I also started to look at our construction industry itself, which has a tremendous amount of waste. We see it on every job site that we do. So what if we had this opportunity to merge the two of them together? So this year, we're rolling out um, some of those prototype public space design systems. The first one is a simple bench just made out of concrete that the, the plants get rid of at the end of the day. We have two concrete plants in the city of Chicago. They already pour, they have to empty out the concrete in the back of the, the drum at the end of the day anyway. They usually make the little barriers that you see in the road or they just stack them up and leave them there. Um, and I said, what would it, how much would it cost if we made a form or you filled it up and then we picked it up? They took it somewhere like zero. It's like, done, that's a great deal. Um, <laughs> so I like that one. So that's what we're starting to roll out now. So it takes the cost of a bench, which like the metal durable bench, which are great, you know, going from twelve, thirteen hundred dollars at a six month waiting period down to how many guys in a truck can you get? And so then you know now we can start to have a conversation of what does material reuse look like in Chicago at a very large scale? What's this wasted marketplace that we kind of exist in? And then how can we actually get furniture on site faster at lower price points? that allow for more rapid turnarounds and revitalization of the sites. And it was built on, all of this was built on five years of experience. So I talked about the first, one of the first projects out of latent design was Fresh Moves. One of the other ones was the first, which, so the Fresh Moves was the first time kind of like working within a self-contained design system. How Activate started was back in 2010 as well. Um, it was the first time making an urban design system and what does that look like? And so we look at define, design, deploy. That's our motto now. You know, if we put it down to three words, define the context, design the content, deploy, deploy a solution. And Activate kind of fit within that. And I believe this quote. I totally believe it. If you're familiar with Candy Chang's work, familiar with her presentations, this is something that has resounded with me over the years, is that our spaces are as profound as we allow them to be. It's a choice. It's a choice not only as a citizen, but then it's also a choice as a designer. And we have to navigate those dichotomies internally within our profession as well in the cities that we live in. And so in my early on, I saw that you know our work 
doesn't have to look like architecture. A bus isn't technically architecture. It doesn't have to last forever. We see that within our work many times from spaces that last a couple years to ones that are going to take a couple years to build. And it's that these ephemeral experiences start to create the collective memory of our, our safety nets, of our social spaces, of our esteem, of the zen that we are all trying to achieve as individuals. And so as I mentioned before, Activate started back in 2010. And what we saw is we were approached by a client in a neighborhood on the west side of Chicago. And they said, hey, we, we have these two vacant lots. And we're like, yeah, you have two vacant lots. We have another client who has like 10. The city of Chicago has 10,000. And there's neighborhoods where vacant lots are absolutely the horizon line in the neighborhood. But that doesn't mean that they have to be the baseline in terms of what defines that neighborhood. And so when we started to look at this um, design challenge, we saw vacancy is either strategic or accidental. And you could kind of infer that, you could follow that any other way. But we also had to understand that this subversive cartography that overlays the city. And so there's a cartography that are around these two sites, that are around that block. You start to think of it in the formal sense where sidewalks are, where buses go, but then how the informal is how people cut across, or the two guys who park their trucks on there. Like that's informal uses uh, overlaying that. So in 2010, I led a design team, and we looked at this problem where what, how do we develop a process about this? Because as I said, there's, there's multiple lots across the city. So it was the first time using a design competition as a delivery method. We came up with the Activate Public Space Design Competition, which is a terrible name. It was like super long. We couldn't fit it like in any of the Bustler, um, you know, header word counts because it was like too many letters. But we looked at it as like, okay, Design competition challenged designers to rethink public space on a thousand for a year-long installation on a thousand dollar budget. Because that's what we had, that's what our client had, that's what all they were really to take a serve a design risk for something in two lots that they didn't technically have complete ownership over to do a public works infrastructure. They had ownership over just to kind of like manage and maintain it. And so we put that out into the world. We said, hey, you know, here we go, world, this is what Chicago wants to talk about public space. And we, you know, we designed it in a way that the, the delivery, design delivery format was two 11 by 17 pieces of paper. So we wanted it to be a weekend project. We didn't want a whole entire office working on it. We didn't, we wanted people to you know, do it last minute because we wanted them to be able to get their ideas out in the world very fast, take on that prototyping uh, mentality. Uh, we found out that it did resonate very far, and we had 120 entries come from across the world with the winning design team of uh, uh, collaboration, Moss Studio, that was both in Chicago and in Barcelona. And so they uh, embodied the, all the three P's of creative placemaking, right? You have paint, you have plywood, you have plants. Ah, uh, placemaking, right? Um, that, you know, we see that a lot in many examples and many folks of tactical urbanism. But what was interesting about this is, you know, their, their, their concept behind it was to create a landscape. So they made this undulating landscape where there wasn't one. Uh, so they created this artificial topography. They made a module in a sense that could be expanded or contraction depending on site, site size or budget, add more mud. Get more money, add more modules, smaller side labs, makes sense. And what I love about this photo is what the people that you're seeing around it. The two individuals, the man and woman in the front, are the only actual signed up volunteers who came to install day. It was one long 12 hour install day. Everyone in the back is, that's analog social networks happening. So if somebody's getting off a bus, see something being filled, goes grabs a friend, brings someone back, says, you know, can okay, I paint this red, you give them a brush, and you build, you build the social network that was used to create the new social contract, which is what the site now, which became the future of the site. So within six months of that project going in, the community partners that we were with, the non-for-profit, and all of those informal, um, now formalized stakeholders is what you would technically call them, you know, they raised over $100,000 in the legal right to turn those two lots into something new. 
So that from an ownership structure, it's the same lot six months later, and that's actually starting to tear up that concrete to make it into a new parklet and play space is what they wanted. And so what we saw and what, we, what was resonating about that is that you have these informal actions highlight the gaps in the formal system. There was no way for that group to get that sort of both personal and financial capital to do that without having the provocation. And then because there was a system behind that provocation, there was a process behind it, they could actually carry that through. And so now it's a completely massive uh, community garden, fully producing overall in the five years since that project, this is info from 2015, we have eight new public spaces that were created out of the team that worked on that project. We continued to activate for five more years before it went into a citywide program. Um, two new businesses sprouted out of that, so two new food-based businesses came out of there, one dealing with honey of bees and then one dealing with the consultancy around urban agriculture. One new nonprofit came out of that, so a spin-off of the, the, the parent non-for-profit came out of that. So what is that worth? Is that worth the thousand dollars we invested in plywood? Is that worth the hundred thousand dollars that was raised afterwards? What is the overall return on investment for all of those individuals and the businesses that come out of it? That's something that is powerful, but very hard to measure. And I don't know how to measure that. So I'm not an economist. You know, I'm not. You know, I'm not in the social sciences sector, so that's where we started to see we have to collaborate with those fields to actually start to make a different type of business case, a different um, case for what a, a true return, a, a sociological return on investment could be. And so now this is Activate Now. So the Activate program, we're working on 50 public spaces across the city of Chicago. Um, the vacant lot program, that's fun and continues to grow into its own thing. So vacant lots now turned into a dollar lot program where the city is taking their city-owned land, selling it off for a dollar in different neighborhoods. We still collaborate with the, the Department of Planning on that. So lots kept growing in their own way because land is one type of groundscape. Then we have the public right-of-way is another type of groundscape. And so now we're working on the public right-of-way and in public space which I found out public space is also different than the third higher, like the third governing groundscape in a city, which is park space. So all three of those are very different. All three of those have different governing and policy bodies behind them. I found that out the very hard way by being an RFP. And so with Activate, we're in these 50 spaces. It's a three-year prototype and a pilot program that we're developing from scratch for the city. What's interesting about this chart, and we heard this the first time we went to city council was, you know, there's no public spaces in my ward. Because everything blue is only where we're working. Everything hatch is where there's no, there's technically no legal public space in that neighborhood. So we're only addressing maybe 50% of the city, and that is just even of itself a very illuminating fact to look at where public space is and is not in the city, and what does that, how does that get actually made. And so that's part of like, that's a three year lifeline is starting to talk about how do we make a public space system that actually not only enhances existing space, but makes a process to make new public space. For comparison, we all forget because they're like little plazas, some are as big as this room, some are smaller. We decided, well, we have to figure out what, how much area do we have because we, we need to analyze that and we have to do a comparison. So we did a comparison with the most notable park spaces and then all the public spaces in the city. Because we have lots, we have hundreds and hundreds of parks, but we only have these 50 public spaces in the city, which is just starts to be a very funny narrative when you lay them out together. So spatially, all scale to the same. You have Millennium Park, Maggie Daly, Lucas Museum, if they ever get through court, the Obama Library, where I say it should go, and Washington Park, when you make the diagrams, you can say whatever you want, which is you know, a very useful academic lesson you know, when you're making your, your final thesis, stop diagrams, just knowing you could make them say whatever you want to say. The river walk, which of course Carol's going to talk about on Friday, that little sliver of land right here, and then little sliver of land right here, and then Northerly Island, and then on the far right, you have all the plaza spaces, all 50 plaza spaces, which aren't impressive. You know, they're just little dots and triangles. It's just geometry. It's a pattern. It's not, you know, public space quite yet. 
So we started to rationalize it a little bit more. It's like, okay, take the spatial away. What if we aggregate it? Because this is a program that's looking at public space across a whole city at the macro level that's aggregated. So the black dots in the middle are scaled size, the amount of the, the area, and then the blue is the amount of funding that went towards it. Okay? So now we're seeing a completely different relationship itself. Uh, left to right, same. So Millennium Park. Um, is about 24 acres, has about $450 a square foot to create and show you more infrastructure, all these other things, but you get the point. As you move down, we have Riverwalk, which was about $1,100 a square foot. Again, a lot of infrastructure work. Northerly Island, which is one of our first nature stakes and a biological habitat, doesn't have as much infrastructure, but still has site work was at $2.40, uh, $2.40 a square foot, and then the little, little, little blip at the end, which isn't, a do isn't dust on the screen or anything, is activate. So we're actually the only one that's inverted. Public space, we have over two, nearly 13 acres of public space, which is more than the Obama Library and the Lucas Museum are pretty online combined. It's half the size of Millennium Park, but we're at $0.09 cents a square foot. So that's the public funding that's going towards public space was nine cents a square foot. So we can make this case and start to look at it as like, you know, yeah, the city's literally not giving a dime to public space. We could, we could say that factually. We used your, we did exactly what you wanted, you used your open data portal, and we just searched through a bunch of records, found out where funding was going, came to this number. Um, and then we also had a look at what's going on with these irrational economics, you know, because it's not, Economics, it's like two pot economics that we have to deal with. So I need to make a dollar out of nine cents. Like that's the goal at the end of three years. Like how can I get a dollar per square foot of funding for this program to make it sustainable and would still be half as much as the next space at Northern the Island. So it takes a lot to do this. And this is like part of the rabbit hole that I fell in when you start to look at this. It's not I can design beautiful objects for all of these public spaces, but that it's not a question of possibility or imagination. It's really a question of policy. So because we're naive in the firm and we read all these massive contracts for the first time, we decided to make a contract for civic innovation. You know, innovation is a great word, civic's a great word. Put them together, you actually get um, your council members to listen to you because everyone wants to be a civic innovator. We learned, again, that doublespeak, we had to learn new words, new languages, new ways to use them. So the city and many cities are like this. You have a marketing ordinance, so you can market any asset that the city owns. You know, that's how you get billboards, that's how you get your bike share, you know, all these things. We already had a public space um, initiative in Chicago called Make Way for People, which I don't like, that's why we kept the name Activate. Um, and that's, that governs the public right of way, so we tweaked that. And then we added the private sector interest on top of that, so we made, found a way through our contract to make exclusivity in a city contract where you can never have exclusivity. Like you, that's, that's completely the opposite of what you can do. And so we had to understand how to learn that, um, and I think most of it is, is I, I, I think, you know, a year out of thinking about it, <laughs> It was mainly done because I'm stubborn and I have a good lawyer, was, was how most of it happened. But how do you actually think about economic opportunity with the within a comprehensive urban design plan? If we really, if the goal is looking at place as a platform, that's an urban design system. How does that actually get made? How do smart cities get made? How does a bike counter get in? How does a bench get in? How does, you know, how does more land get allocated to public use? That's all part of the urban design system that we end up with the parameters, uh, and that's what we design as architects, as urban designers, but what if we could actually create the parameters? Whoa, that's where we kind of started. It's like we could actually make the parameters through, these, through this contract, and no one's really thinking about it because everyone sees the, little, the one little geometric triangle plaza. They don't see the aggregate of the whole city system. And so when we talk about it, it's in the macro, um, and that's what we're getting to. It's looking at the micro leading to the macro. And so placed as a platform, we are seeking out these mutually beneficial collaborations with bold partners in strategic areas. And so these are some of the strategic areas. Arts and culture, I talked about health and wellness. What does that mean when you're around 
uh, of green space, uh, safe space, what could that start to look like? Tech and data, again, building on the idea of smart cities. What does it look like when I can call up Google and Intersection and Flux and all of their subsidiary companies who are developing products for New York and say, hey, do you want to do a prototype in Chicago? And guess what? You actually don't have to sign a contract with the city and get through their process. You sign a contract with me. So we eliminated that barrier to entry, not only from the everyday citizen, but it also works for the multinational organizations. And that's a wildly unique place to be in to say, let's test, let's prototype something, a smart city infrastructure on our, on our plaza space itself. Entrepreneurship I'll talk about shortly, but what else is needed on these spaces itself, um, I started to look at, you know, you have these place-making principles that focus a lot on the objects and some of the programming and processes, but maybe there's another component that is missing. And so that's where we started to look at small businesses and how does that actually fit in with many of our clients that we've worked with over the years from chambers of commerce who are developing corridor plans, small businesses who are lamenting the inaccessibility of storefront spaces, and all of these wrapped together start to make that social equity conversation and start to get at some of that systemic social equity that I feel and others do that needs to change within Chicago itself. Because it's not about what is being built, it's also about who builds. So again, this idea of real versus perceived access, we're taking the biggest risk, and so by taking that risk, we're allowing others to come in with us. Because partnering with the city is a huge risk, just from a conceptual standpoint down to a logistical contract and insurance standpoint. So if we take that away and saw that as a barrier, what else can we start to do? And at that point, you know, risk is, once you get into that, once you get $5 million of insurance and know that on any of your 50 plazas, if somebody trips and falls, they can, they can sue you, you're like, well, let's just go wild. You know, what does it matter at that point? We're kind of on the line for three years. You kind of just have to go and build with that. And so now we started to look at, because of this project design priorities, how do we get into the qualitative methods of it? And over the past year, we've built these seven design priority areas that we look at not only activate, but then all of our projects start to wrap around it. And that's because in the process of reading all of the city contracts that we had for reference, we started actually reading the city plans. Like, oh my gosh, we have a pedestrian plan, we have a cultural plan, we have a tech plan. We're probably the only ones who have actually read them now. Um, and we put them all together and start to say, well, these are the areas that the city's looking at. So how do we look at what our projects are doing for engagement or economics or creating transit-oriented development, be able to map that and then tie it back to those strategic plans itself. That gives our client power, that gives us information, and that gives the, that's the tactical leverage that many of our projects and our clients need. So if you think about it, because I do work within the social impact sector, that's a layer cake of funding. That's private funding, that's donations, that's traditional philanthropy, as much as it is grants. And so how powerful is that when a client can say, sure, we're creating a community space, but it's also going to meet these five transit-oriented development goals. We're doing programming that meets the tech plan. It's going to be sustainable in terms of hitting your stormwater infrastructure plan from 2013 and have priority areas to reference immediately back. So that takes an idea and maybe a glossy uh, presentation deck and turns it into how you're making the city that all of our that our mayor and our policy leaders and our council is saying that they want to make. So how do you take those legislative le legislative policies and turn them into action? So the last piece that I looked at and I talked about this is the entrepreneurship. And this is the third prong of the Activate program. And this is actually our biggest Trojan horse, the biggest rabbit hole that over the next three years I, uh, I get to love and solve over that. So, over the years, as I mentioned, when we were working with chambers of commerce and we were working with small businesses, we saw that there is a huge gap between startup and storefront. So much so that it became our tagline for the new boombox, the micro retail space that we created. But it also was something that was a very tangible and logistical piece. The biggest gap is capital. So if you think about it, you know, you have to have capital to rent the space, put down the deposit, do your build out, and then have the confidence in your business to sign a minimum five year lease, three years if you have uh, you know, an understanding landlord. And so these are huge barriers to small businesses, especially as we have a retail climate that's moving towards more nomadic retail. So that's the festivals, 
that's you know a digital interface and actually decreasing the amount of inventory that they have. So if you think about this, if you go to a festival, most businesses are set up in a 10 by 10 tent, right? That's 100 square feet. You might see the most amazing jeweler and you're like, oh, I wish you would go in this storefront down the street from me. It's 1,000 square feet. That's awesome. That business needs to have 1,000% growth in revenue in order to afford that space. There is nothing that has a 1,000% revenue year, growth in revenue year on the end that could actually do that. So we need to start to look at that and even within the larger, the creators of the built environment, our developers and our building owners and even ourselves start to have to make suggestions on what is the next type of space people are going to use. And we're seeing that because we have clients that are in this arena. And so Boombox was the city of Chicago's first micro retail pop-up. It's made out of a refurbished shipping container. To be honest, I hate shipping containers. I really do. Um, and this was kicking and screaming because I had to actually change my me mentality about it in instead of thinking about it as a space to start to think about it as a material. So between the two, you can't tell this final prop piece and better images um, that you'll see is actually the shipping container because we looked at it from a structural standpoint rather than an aesthetic standpoint and that changed the game. So we could get an ugly shipping container like this guy down here because we don't need it to look pretty. We cut off all the sides. We could get that guy for free. Like, it's, there's so many of them. It's just We just need the four corners, the top and the bottom. So we only had to get it shipped to our warehouse got it cut apart for free. The guys in the yard were like happy as heck to get rid of one. And they like using blowtorches apparently. So they had a good day. I got a free shipping container. And that's how we got a structural system for the, the first boom box. Because when we priced everything out, welding all of those individual steel members, the labor that goes to it, I would have a frame for you know, $8,000 versus $1,000 of the delivery and some of the in-shop labor. Like, that's a no-brainer. So looking at this as an opportunity to rethink some of our existing structures and then even some ways within our design industry is framing what cargo texture can do and look like. So this is a quick one and a half minute video of what went down the day we installed it. We, we created it mostly in a warehouse and then Programming and uh, 
users to come and transform the space and the adjacent public space as needed. The um, exterior cladding material is hardy board, so it's the back side of hardy board where what we, what we ordered and got on site um, was not gray, because of course we ordered gray, um, but it wasn't gray, it looked green in the daylight and we hated, I, I completely hated it. And so it was completely by chance that when they were leaning them up against the, the structure, we saw the backside, and this backside was this beautiful watercolor pattern to it from, it's a remnant of the dye process. So we said, let's flip them all backwards, let's go with it, it's probably gonna get graffiti in a year or two, let's at least have a better time looking at it <laughs> over the first year before someone tags it. And you can't tell. So we've had architects come up and looked at it, it's like, this is cement board. It's like, yes it is. What kind, what brand, what this, is it? You know, it's like, it's hardy board. It's like the cheapest cement board everyone knows. It looks terrible all the time, but we have a new use for it. And we were very happy about that. Um, We've looked at this as, you know, now how is this uh, part of a supportive infrastructure, a supportive small business infrastructure, and can now provide exposure specifically to minority and women-owned businesses. Again, I look at, you know, what my business went through. I mean, the architecture and design field is its own animal, but how would, if I sold chocolate, how would I actually scale my business up? Because we have to look at this um, in a unique way where we, we should be, nourishing and supporting businesses out of a variety of neighborhoods across the city, but we can't always, those businesses can't be always supported from the neighborhoods that they're coming from. So how can we get these products in front of high income areas? Where we're at on Milwaukee Avenue uh, in Wicker Park, uh, that's a median income of like seventy-five dollars to $80,000 where the woman who, this chocolatier, who is totally being to bar, is coming from a neighborhood where the median income is $27,000 a year. So that's, in, in two miles difference, we have a $50,000 yearly income gap and difference there. So we, it's, it's part of that conversation that we need to have. And it was resounding, so we saw within the first six months, it, the first one went up in September, we're fundraising for two more now. We saw national recognition, so from South by Southwest to Metropolis to the AIA, and this year we actually do win an AIA award. It will be public uh, next month, so that kind of makes up for that whole losing to a chandelier five years ago. I think I'm okay with it. I'm okay with still paying dues then. <laughs> uh, and so we kind of look at this as design as this foil. You know, it does reflect the latent factors that influence our built environment. So that's our zoning, our policy, our funding, our ethos, and our will. And to do that requires us to apply this integrative thinking model to all of our planning and policy models. And to let design illuminate the areas that might have otherwise been stifling us as creatives, as individuals, and possibly even as a city. So I kind of look at this as you know, take things very personal because I do, and I do that because I'm, as I said, a citizen in and a designer of cities. That's why it's personal to me. And the micro and the macro are a continuum; they're not opposing ends of the same scale. So Activate and the work that we do is part of this new Zeno's paradox, in a sense, where it occupies the smallest and the largest at the same time. And that's the practice that I'm creating, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing about that for today. And you know, thank you for your time and your interest. working with one of our partners who came out of the, uh, my alma mater out at IIT, but out of the School of Design, where they created a geolocated 
um, map of the city to map different types of experiences and storytelling and story. So it's a geolocated storytelling app. Um, so we're actually going to map all the plazas on that and create a custom custom tour. So it gets back into that subversive cartography. And as they build their their app platform, you know, people can input different pieces of information. So it it, it we'll see how that works. You know, we could get the real-time feedback. I don't know, it could be a huge success. It could be totally dumb. But it's kind of part of how do we build awareness and the stories behind every one of the public spaces, which are very different. I mean, one public space was made because there was a building on it that firefighters died in, and so it was memorialized as a public space for the firefighters. You could find, like, one little plaque about that. Is that interesting? Maybe it's more interesting because you know that story and you could listen to it, so it's multimedia. Um, but again, we're going to see how that starts to track. That's what we're actively taking a part of right now. And as our partnerships build, we'll start to see what, what other pieces of data will come into the program itself, whether, and what, how does that augment our information out of it. You know, we could exist perfectly fine in the analog, you know, just having events, seeing who shows up and have the conversation, and that's kind of what's needed more so than the digital aspect. But you still have to make something that people actually want to take a picture of because it's not on Instagram. It kind of doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. So you, you talk about your firm as being one that was formed by necessity, mm -hmm. and I'm just kind of interested to know because you know it seems like you do a lot of things that aren't architecture, mm -hmm. as you described. So you know, like when you got out of school and you know when you were first working, did you kind of see yourself doing this kind of work? No, I started working as an affordable housing firm, and so now we're starting to come full circle on affordable housing projects. And it was working at that firm where I saw the very stark hierarchy of where architects sat within an affordable housing development project. So we'd go to meetings where there's 20, 25 people from the housing authority, from the private developer side, from the finance side, from different departments within the city, and like our segment of the meeting is like so narrow out of that. It's like, whoa, this is the, these homes and these buildings, which were, go, I worked on a project that was the Robert Taylor homes, which was literally across the street from IIT, which were getting torn down while I was at school in IIT, and there wasn't a studio professor that was talking about it. So we were having a massive deconstruction of affordable housing and a whole entire social infrastructure having, happening across the street from our architecture school, and we weren't having a critical dialogue about it within the school. And that's what prompted me. I was like, well, I'm going to figure out build, or building that project. I'm going to go work for them. And then when I started working for them, I was like, well, our, designs, our design styles didn't match. That's fine. It probably doesn't match for many of the firms you start working with. But then I, it was very good in teaching me how things got built and being able to offer that opportunity to sit in on those meetings. And that started that curiosity to understand how the built environment gets created. And so from there, it went these kind of meandering paths of like, well, let me actually create something from concept to construction, very small, and make it larger, 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 and it frames the services that are now in the firm. So we're licensed architects, we're licensed contractors, we only design build our own projects, usually the small ones, like they have a development budget of 250 square feet or $250,000 or less because I can't get some of the larger contractors to get out of bed, and we have a great net for those projects, and then we have a great network of fabricators, so we, we custom fabricate, design and fabricate as much as we can, we like that relationship that we have. Projects that go from like 250 and above, we just fit in the traditional architecture role, but we have an understanding of design build methodologies, and then with Boombox itself, it might be an area where we actually become developers, because we already wrote the policy to make bring commercial real estate to public space, or the opportunity to kickstart small businesses through pop-up retail. We're actively working with the planning department now to write an ordinance that allows that for land. And if we do that with land, that completely changes what our opportunity area is. So we can go to about 50 sites to you know, 5 million square feet of city-owned vacant land on commercial corridors. So it's a very interesting organic growth. It's very unplanned. Um, and I wish I had a, a better business model that could anticipate that um, to begin with. But I'm, the answer now is I was wanted to understand how the built environment got built and then ended up in a situation where I, I was the one creating all aspects of the built environment. And that wasn't an answer that I could have anticipated five years ago when I got laid off. 
I was just like, I, I thought, I honestly thought Layton Design was going to last for a year. That was going to be my maternity leave, because like, first of all, no one's going to hire a pregnant licensed architect. Um, and so I thought that was going to be my maternity leave, and then I would get, because I think I'm amazing, right? So I thought someone was totally going to hire me, but I think I got, that never happened, and maybe that's a good thing, because I still have the firm. And so my, when I talk about plan B becoming plan A, that was latent, and then the plan of what I wanted to create as an architect, he just got flipped on his head. This is kind of a comment, um, more so than a question, but maybe you can add to it. And what I really admire is um, the anecdote about how you talked about um, the little old ladies and men who didn't want to use the yeah. iPads, or how you make a market that's a market that like, people need to recognize it's a market. And I find a, a good, that to be a good metaphor for how you're discussing architects and architecture. So how do you get um, the architects to realize that something that you might not perceive as architecture actually is architecture, right? So mm -hmm. how, as developing designers, can we forward that process right. from our standpoint kind of say, okay, we're doing this design. Right. Um, it might not look like that. Yeah, and that's it's a it's a it's a great question. And it's a difficult piece to answer because I'm still vacillating between two extremes on how we do that. Um, on one end, you have the encroachment of designers into space. IDEO hires architects. They do spatial design um, within the firm itself. They make space, and they're recognized sometimes, impro obviously improperly, as architects of space. So there's been the appropriation of the term. Um, so maybe we have to, we either have to take that back in our own way within an industry or we talk about it very differently. Everything spatial can be done at the hand of an architect from the selection of the seats to how wide this is. You know, we talk about it and we have this kind of quirky knowledge of the, the intersectionality of codes. You know, so our extremes are we either let architects drive that conversation because they're the ones that are left making true design decisions that we get that the public can see. You know, we see how the Arc Angles makes a new design for the Redskins Stadium, and that's impressive to us. They're like, ah, that's an architect. They're showing how all of us use design as a tool and can shape a vision. Or we become another form of administrative assistance and, and solve a problem of permits. Because I know in our projects, and it kind of gets back to yours, where many of our projects aren't architecture, but we're solving design systems. And being an architect hasn't always, it hasn't been a benefit, but it hasn't been a hurdle. And so when I think about, you know, when I work with restaurant designers or I work with other people, you know, they're making spatial decisions that, that you know, we may agree with or may not agree with. But you could see those, those are the two extremes. So it's like, Utopia or like post apocalyptic but I don't want to kind of move towards where we are solving an administrative problem of permits versus the potential of design. And we, we exist already, very much of the industry exists already over here because there's so many shitty buildings out there. And with that, because <laughs> what can you say after that? Uh, Catherine, I want to thank you on, on behalf of uh, everybody here at the school for. Uh, a really um, fast-paced, uh, very engaging and exciting lecture. I think there are several TED Talks in this, <laughs> and you are made for a TED. I, it, sounds, it sounds to me. So I want to thank you for coming. Thank you for having me.